Last couple of weeks, we've been talking about one word. What's that word? Distinction. Have you been thinking about this? How many of you went home and made butter last week? Did anybody go home and make butter last week? Well, I know, I know these, these guys, Dwayne and Lynn, they went home and they made butter. Or they had the butter. They took the butter home from, from that we did make last week. And then I had some butter too. And, and I'm telling you what, just smearing that on the crackers, it was so good. It's so fresh. If you didn't watch that message, you need to go back and watch that message. Distinction. We're talking about distinction. In light and in darkness, there's a distinction. In clean and unclean, there's a distinction. In holy and profane, there's a distinction. In belief and unbelief, there's a distinction. In life and in death, there's a distinction. And I was just thinking just, just about these people who we raised our hands for, the people who we love, the people who we know who need Jesus. And what I want to do is I, I want to encourage you today that you would just consider, Lord, how can I be more distinct around them? What can I do to shine a little brighter for them? And so I'm just praying today that the, the message is, uh, is strong for you, that it's encouraging for you to be able to, to do this, or it just it prompts you to. So this morning what I want to do, I want to share four things that Jesus said. There's a lot of scripture reading today. I love to, to read. I love to read a lot of scripture. So I want to talk about the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. I want to talk about being salt and light in Matthew 5. I want to talk about hot, cold, or lukewarm in Revelation 3. And I want to talk about the parable of the sheep and the goats. Again, that's in Matthew 25. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today because we need you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be with us today, that you would fill us, that you would encourage us, you would teach us, you would prompt us. Father, that, that we would be all of the things that we're going to talk about today, that we would be distinct in this world, that people would see us and want what we have or want to know what we know, especially about you, about salvation. But we thank you today. Lord, would you be with us, be among us, and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start in Matthew 25, and Jesus makes a distinction between what is wise and what is foolish, a distinction between those who have oil in their lamps at the coming of the bridegroom and those who do not, and those who keep watch, and those who are not keeping watch. So I want to read all of this to you right now, and if you want to follow along, but I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you really, bring your Bibles to church. Bring your Bibles, you can follow along, but bring your sermon journals. I haven't talked about that for a while, but if you need one, we have them out there. But stop at the store, grab a journal, get a, get a pen, always plan to come to church with that, and take your notes, and just things that, the, that God is speaking to you during the time of worship and the message. But in Matthew chapter 25, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones, they took their lamps, but not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, you go to those who sell oil, and you buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. And these are eight of the hardest words that I think 
you could hear Jesus speak. Truly, I tell you, I don't know you. There is a distinction. He said, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The distinction of being ready. Now, what I'm not going to do today, because we could take, you know, it would take the whole time. I want the Holy Spirit to use what you just heard to get in you and let it be what you just heard. But I do have, I have some thoughts about this. You could read commentary after commentary after commentary on this, and there are so many different words that people have about this and things that they say. Some would say, you know, well, the, the five that were wise and the five that were foolish. Well, that's the church. And making the assumption, well, half the church is going to be ready. Half the church is not going to be ready. Well, that may not be the point of the whole message. But there are some who will be ready and some who won't. But the distinction of being ready. Some say the, the oil represents the purity, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Others would say that the oil represents righteousness and obedience and living. Some say that it represents holiness. But one thing is for certain. Each had their own oil and their own lamp. That is for certain. Each had a responsibility unto themselves. Each is responsible for their own readiness. And something as a worship leader that I realized many years ago, I realized and, and would sometimes even say that you can't worship vicariously through me. You cannot worship vicariously through Amy or anyone who is on the worship team. You cannot worship vicariously through anybody who is in front of you at an event or anything like that. You are responsible for your own worship. Amen? You can't say, well, I'm just going to enjoy this and bebop a little bit while they're up there. What they're doing is good for me too. It's not the way it works. You are responsible for your own oil and your own lamp and to do it yourself. Does that make sense? Because sometimes we can get lulled to just getting kind of complacent and letting it roll. I heard somebody say one time, again, as a worship leader, it was, it was good to hear that if you're somewhere and, you know, there's music playing and, and we like to blame somebody else. Well, I didn't worship because of this. I didn't because of that. And I didn't because of that. What this person said was just great. And I didn't think this was only good and just in defense of a worship leader. But this person said, if you didn't worship, that's on you and nobody else. That's on you. And I, I, I thought that, that makes a lot of sense because when I'm sitting out there in that place, it's on me. I can't blame somebody else for the reason why I didn't. Amen? It's your own oil. It's your own lamp. Each one is responsible for their own readiness. You're responsible for your own worship. You're responsible for your own praise, and it's your voice that says the name of Jesus. No one can do any of these things for you, and I even think this, you can come to church, you can sit in a chair or a pew, and you can be here, but that doesn't necessarily make you ready. It makes you present, but there were five wise and there were five foolish, and they were all together. You might actually be sitting next to somebody who is or isn't ready. I want to do my best to help you be ready. You might be pretending to be watchful, but you have to be actually watchful. It's like you could pretend to fix a car, but you actually have to fix the car. You can pretend to change a flat tire, but you actually have to change the flat tire. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. We're not living in a time that pretending is a good idea. We are not living in days right now that pretending is recommended. 
if you follow me. Today is a time to be ready, and I'm just going to ask you, do you have your Bible? I would have had my one-year Bible sitting right here, but uh, I left it on the couch next to my backpack. I realized when I got here, I was like, dang, I really love to set my one-year Bible out here on Sundays to give you a reminder. Your pastor's doing it. I want you to be doing it. If you're not in it, if you haven't started, if you're going, what's a one-year Bible? I'm visiting here today. We have them. So if you want a one-year Bible, we can get you a one-year Bible. Find anybody with a lanyard. We will make sure that you get one because it is incredibly important to me that you have access to the Word. It's incredibly important to me that you find it important to read daily, to read the Word, to know the Word. That will be a part of being ready. Amen? We need to do this. And this is a good time to encourage one another. So that's the first thing. The second thing, talking about salt and light in this world and what that means. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. And the, the Greek word there used for, for tasteless, it could be a play on words to mean, again, foolish. We don't want to be foolish, to become foolish. Obviously, Jesus is using salt in this case to talk about how we are, our demeanor in the world. And just to interject in this Matthew passage, in Luke 14, 34 and 35, Jesus said that salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness or its savor, how can it be made savory or salty again? It's neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. I did a little looking into that, of course. I'm, I'm curious, what does it mean that salt is neither fit for the soil or the manure pile? Well, I looked that up, and, and really that word for soil, I tend to think of, you know, the, the dirt that I'm cultivating to plant some things in. It's really not talking about that, I don't think. The, the word there can mean something much larger. It can mean the land. It can even mean the people in the land. And so, if you look, it's neither fit for the land nor for the manure pile. Because there was something that salt was used maybe on the, the manure, maybe to slow down some process on it. It was actually used there for some things in some areas. And, and Jesus is saying, if it's lost its saltiness, it's not even good for that. It's not even good for that. And so there's a distinction of being the salt of the earth. Salt enhances. It brings out the flavor. It makes things better. And if you think about this, this, it's an analogy of us. So I want you to use it that way. Be thinking about this. Holy Spirit, be teaching us, showing us. Salt is a preservative. It is, if you, you could do a complete, incredible, deep study just on salt. And I got into this, and I'm like, okay, that is a message or two all by itself. Maybe that's a good Bible study, but I'm going to tell you something. There's some stuff about salt that you probably didn't know. Salt's a preservative. It's necessary to human life. We need salt in the earth. It needs salt. The gospel is necessary to human life. Salt heals. Salt does so many things. Christy and I, in 1998, and I have talked about this from time to time, but we walked and hitchhiked 1,300 miles in 1998 from Daytona Beach to Boston, Massachusetts. Yes, we were out of our minds. We didn't have cell phones at that time. We had a heavy Mac laptop that we carried in a backpack. For a while, we carried a tent. Uh, you know, we, we used it a few times. We ended up mailing it home because we just we started staying in people's homes all over the place. It was incredible. From day to day, we didn't know where we were going, who we were going to be with. We were literally led by the Holy Spirit every single day. We would show up in a town, go to a gas station, and we would just start talking to people, see where the Lord led us. I mean, it was a magnificent time. It was a magnificent time in our lives. But there was something that happened right at the beginning. And 
the reason why we went on this walk is because I broke my back in 1990. And just keeping a, a very long story short, I was healed of what happened to me. I was supposed to walk with a floppy foot, and the doctor said I would never run again. But all of those things happened. I was, I was able to run. I ran fast. And so it was an incredible time. So I wanted to do something, giving the Lord praise for what this was, but I didn't really want to do it in the Lord at first. I just, it was really in the flesh. So the Lord closed every single door. Until I met Christy, I said, you know, I kind of wanted to do this thing. And she said, oh, that would be fun. And then when the time came to do it, I said, I think it's time to do the walk. Oh, you still really want to do that? <laughs> I said, yep, yeah, we're going to do that. It wasn't her walk. She came with me. And she suffered the most from it, from her feet. She had some calluses and, and, and all of this walking, even though we had good, good boots. I mean, it's just all of this... But she suffered a lot in her feet, and we happened to stay with a, a family, uh, and there's so many great stories here. Um, George and Helen Cessna, yes, uh, relatives of the Cessna airplane people. We stayed with them, and, and uh, so many messages. I, I could stop this message right here and tell you so many great stories of what the Lord had done. But we got her feet into salt. And we were walking on the ocean. Helen said, you need to go down by the ocean and walk in the ocean today. And, and just spend some time putting, putting feet, the healing properties that are just in the salt water of the ocean. This is from God. It's from God. It's so magnificent. And he wants our faith, our lives, our Christian believing faithful lives to be like this in the earth. Because salt has penetrated everywhere. You can find salt everywhere. And it's necessary to life. The gospel is necessary to life. One author states that I wrote or read, and he said that what salt is to the natural, the Christian believer is to the moral. I just thought, man, that's profound. What salt is to the natural, the Christian is to the moral. You have a responsibility to be salt in this world. And there are so many more things, so many things that we could open up about what, what salt is. Salt affects life in every way. So must we. If you profess Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you need to be having a, have an effect on your world. Salt has a distinct purpose in life, like you has a distinction. Life would be extinct without salt. Can you believe that? It is that necessary. Salt has antiseptic properties. They used to say uh, you, you would get a cut or a wound. They would say, throw salt on the wound. Anybody old enough to remember that? Throw salt on the wound. Salt kills bacteria. Salt does so many things. But throwing salt on the wound, listen to this. The world we live in has a wound. The world around you is wounded. The unbeliever is wounded and needs salt. It needs you. It needs you to be salt. There was a guy that I was talking to a couple of weeks ago. He was telling me about another friend of his, and he said, and I, and I hadn't heard this expression in a long time, and he said, oh, he's the salt of the earth. And I was like, Wow, I mean, it stood out to me. That meant that this guy's salt was really salty. Salt delicious in the world. <laughs> and you need to be too. Amen? Be salt. But along with being salt in the world, you are the light of the world. Jesus continued in Matthew 5. He said that you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You wouldn't light a lamp and hide it. It would defeat the purpose. He said, your light must shine before people in such a way, in such a way 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It has to be evident. The light that comes from you has to be evident. Set it on a lampstand. Get it up there high. Don't make it low. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't put it away. You want to use it to shine. Shine your light. And I... I know this can be a really good Sunday school message. But I can tell you this. Some of you, some of us, at different times, we don't necessarily leave our home with our lamp, do we? It's easy to shine at home, or it's easy to shine here, but it's those hard places in life. It are those darker places in life. And sometimes, okay, well, maybe I'll take it with me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in the car. I'm going to leave my light in the car. And I'm just going to go in because I don't want to stand out that much. We'll go back to last week's message about being a distinction. If you're a follower of Jesus, the cross that you carry is a strong distinction anyway. I'm telling you what, guys, there is going to come a day you will not be judged by your friends. You'll be judged by the Holy One. Amen? You will be judged by the Holy One. Don't leave your light at home when you go out. Don't leave your light in the car when you go in. Is your light under a bowl or a lampstand? And again, I want, I want to just, I want to encourage you with all my heart, do not Be ashamed of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that light that shines in you for all who raise their hands, who knows? I hope that there are people out there who are going to get, just because we're going to start praying now for that person in my world, we pray for people in your world, that somebody gets around them and reinvigorates or lights that again or he sees something that, I want that. I need that. Don't be ashamed. And I say this sometimes at our Christmas Eve candlelight service when we're all lighting these lights. Can you imagine a room that is just pitch black dark? Not not one bit of light creeping in from any place. You light one candle. And that one candle has an impact on that room that that room cannot overpower. And I want you to think about that as your world. I want you to think about that at the places that you go into. Spiritually speaking, you're going to walk into very dark places, aren't you? Spiritually speaking, you're going to walk into some places that you have no idea what's going to happen. And immediately, it makes me think of your testimony, James, when you walked into uh, a certain establishment and hear a song playing on the radio, you put your arms up and you became a shining light in a very dark place. Incredible. You have to be willing to be obedient to shine that light because you never know when salvation is coming. This is not just a Sunday school message to be salt and light. I don't perceive that Jesus gathered all the children around him, got them up on his knees and said, all the adults, you, can, you, you don't have to pay attention to this. I'm going to talk to the little ones here. You know who he was talking to? You. One single light is powerful. Please don't underestimate that. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, it cannot, and it will not ever overpower it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. That song we sang. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid to let your light shine for Jesus for all to see, because it is a beautiful Distinction, And I'm going to show you a picture. There was a guy that I, I worked at the state fair uh, the summer of 2019. And just uh, I got to, got to work with some friends and have some fun down there. It was exhausting. Uh, but I want to show you a picture. You see this picture? Okay. This guy, nobody's there. It's 8 o'clock, 10 to 8. Eight, maybe it was right at 8 o'clock. Nobody was there yet. This guy's just bebopping down the street, him and another friend. And I'm like, who's this guy, you know, this character? I mean, he's smiling. It's 8 a.m. I'm like, Phew. 8 a.m., and he is just, just lit up. 
I jumped out in the street, got right in his way, and I said, hey, man, what's the reason for your joy? And he goes, it's Jesus, man, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, you got to come over here because we're going to get to know each other. And I'm like, do you mind if I get a picture with you? No, man, let, you know, it just, it was so cool. Well, I stayed in touch with this young man. And started to develop a relationship with him and, and got to do a little bit of mentoring with him as well. His name is Andrew. And then Andrew got a new phone and I lost touch of Andrew. Would you be praying that somewhere, somewhere that I get to connect with him again? Because he's very special. Very special. He became special to me. Put your light on a lampstand. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Live your life with such a distinction that people can't help but wonder and want what you've got. The third thing, are you hot, are you cold, or are you lukewarm? I'm going to tell you this, I have the best well water anywhere. If you want to come over and test my well water, you can it is delicious. I would bottle it and sell it if I could. It's so good. In fact, I know other people uh, say they've got the best well water too, but I'm telling you, we, we can sprinkle our yard. We can do all this stuff. There's hardly any iron in it. It, is, it, is, it doesn't turn everything orange. You know, it is delicious, incredible. We don't soften it. We don't treat it. We don't filter it. We don't do anything. Never have. And, and I don't want to. It is so good coming right out of the ground. I love it. And that's probably the one thing that would keep me from moving or selling my house. And if I did, I'm going to charge all of the money for the water. <laughs> Almost nothing for the house. There's cold spring water in a place that was called Colossae. It was like that. Incredible, good, cold water. And what you wouldn't give. Maybe I'm making you thirsty right now. Anybody want a glass of water? Yeah. It's pretty good. It's not bad. It's not like mine, but you can use the fountain if you need to. But how about the healing benefits of a hot mineral spring? You ever sat in one of those? Anybody ever been to a natural hot spring and you sit in those? It's pretty nice, isn't it? Yeah. It feels good. You know, the uh, little stinky, you said, yeah, a little sulfury smell, but, but healing. All the mineral and everything that's in there, very healing. And, you know, I've been to a couple of places in my travels and you get to sit in a hot spring and it's really nice. The Dead Sea, kind of like that. Very healing. Wonderful. There's so many minerals in the Dead Sea that you're slippery when you come out. It's pretty cool. You want to go with me someday? Yeah. Come on, let's go. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, look at this. It says, I know your deeds. Jesus is talking here. Remember, these are the words of Jesus. You are neither cold nor hot. And I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And so I've got a little map. I don't know if, did you see the map already? Put that up there. So you can see there's a place called uh, Hierapolis. And there's a place called Colossae. And Colossae is where the cold water came from. And Hierapolis is where... The hot spring was, and in Laodicea, they were bringing this water because Laodicea was in a place they didn't have either. They had to pipe it in. And so by the time it traveled the distance from one of the places all the way down there, one of, uh, Colossae is about nine miles out, and uh, Hierapolis, Hierapolis is about six miles out. But if you can imagine, after nine miles of a stone aqueduct, that that hot water would be like what? Eh. Or how about that refreshing cold water coming from Colossae all the way to Laodicea, all that way in a stone aqueduct, cold, fresh water. By the time it gets there, it's what? It's lukewarm. What it is, is useless. That's what Jesus is saying. It's useless. And he's saying to them, your faith is like that. We don't want that. Amen? We don't want to have that kind of faith. We don't want to have that kind of effect on the world. That's a blending in. 
That's not putting your lamp on a lampstand. That's not being salt. That's not being light. It's being lukewarm. It's being dim. Saltless, flavorless. But you could see why Jesus was wanting them to be either hot or cold because either one of those would be better. The distinction of the people of Laodicea was that they were lukewarm. And I'm standing here today because I don't want that to be yours. I do not want that to be your distinction. To be lukewarm. To say, you know what? I would rather be more comfortable and just kind of blend in. Not white or black, but I'd rather just be a little more gray. Anywhere in this space, but not that easily identifiable. I'm just telling you. It's a distinction, and we need to do something about that. We need to be salt and light. We need to be hot or cold. And the last thing is the passage of the sheep and the goats, and this is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. It's a little bit longer. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all his angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory, or his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Why? Because there will be a distinction between the two. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you look after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, or go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those that is left, Depart from me, you who are accursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? And he will reply, well, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And I read that, and again, that's, that's an incredible passage. This is a passage that aims us at the end. It's a passage that aims us at the judgment. And I will tell you, at the end, distinctions will be made. And I want you to be well aware of that today. There's a distinction between those who paid attention to the least of these and those who did not. And I will tell you that the distinction is faith. The distinction is is what did you believe? Because your faith is what leads you to do the things that you do. Your ministry, your love toward others, is the natural fruit of your faith in Jesus, or it should be. Your love for others happens because of your love for your Savior. Amen? Why would you go and serve others so completely and so selfishly? It's because the love of Jesus compels you to. And maybe you're being reminded right now, oh my goodness, I need to get back out there. I, there's, there's some things I really need to do. And this is a prompting for you. The kind of selfless love that makes you distinct. Because when the Son of Man comes, Jesus asks this question, 
will I find faith on the earth? And that faith lived out. The faith that shines, the faith that's salty, the faith that is evident, the faith that is distinct in this world. Be distinct. Be faithful, no matter what. And I just want to close with this. This little passage. Another distinction. John chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this distinction, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. It doesn't say you got to be best friends. It means don't hate the distinction of love is one of the greatest distinctions that you can possess in the kingdom. A love that emanates from the love that Jesus has for you and the love that you have for him. But when the lost, and this is, this is a sad statement today, but we can do something about this, okay? When the lost look at the church, what do they see? Do they always see the image of love and unity? They do not, sadly. But I will tell you, and I want to encourage you, that as far as it concerns you, that you make sure that's what they see from you. Amen? The church, you, we, we can't deal with what everybody else wants to do and what everybody else wants to say. But I can say it here and I can say it to you. As so far and as much as you are concerned that this would be true, that you have love for one another. Hallelujah. And that you purpose yourself, you go out, determine that, yes, I will do my best to live in unity. I will do my best to have love for my brothers and sisters in Christ in the faith. Because the church is notorious for turning on itself, and we don't need to do that. Amen? Each one will be accountable for their own demeanor within the body of Christ, and you make sure that your demeanor is distinct. You make sure that you have love for one another because it says, this is how everyone will know that you are my disciples.